Chapter 1, Who's the Boss? It was 1996 in West Philadelphia on 52nd and Master Street. It's 3 a.m. in the morning. The 19th District Police are everywhere with red, white, and blue lights illuminating the cold, dark, busy thoroughfare with hundreds of people lined up in the street waiting to see who they would bring out of the go-go after hour in handcuffs. The grindstone is a mysterious private social club. Had the ambience of Harlem Knights offering go-go girls, gambling, booze, and Miss B's delightful soulful dinners. Authorities searched and questioned every patron inside. Then the number one question, who's the boss? Each patron was questioned one by one and had to show ID. Officers pulled out top shelf liquor, ice cold and ported beer. The search produced two matching 12 gauge shotguns equipped with laser sights, a couple of pistols, several knives, countless bags of illicit drugs, several patients emptied their pockets to avoid charges. Little did they know, 5-0 wasn't concerned with the petty contraband. Who the boss? They asked again. The Kingston dread arguing with police answered, I just played a record spawn. He couldn't explain why half naked women were jumping off hard pricks, doing lap dances or tricks, scrambling in the dressing room, pulling their ID out of their dance bag. That's all hiding small caliber pistols, knives. The big raid was here and plans to make big money for tonight was over. The club's DJ had the most to lose. His personal DJ equipment would not be confiscated by police if he could only answer this one question. Who's the boss? 
Amongst the patrons sitting at the bar was an older lady named Miss B. She's dressed in African attire, sipping Coke 45, when police says, uh, who's the boss, miss? We know you know. She simply replied, I'm a grown ass woman. Mm, I don't know shit. Miss B was puffing on a Newport cigarette. She slowly put it out, calmly walked out the building untouched with 7,000 secretly stashed away in her purse. That was the night's bar and food revenues. The police figured that out when the donut patrol found checked the rest of them. Mm. Oh, that's all you gonna give us? You gonna stop right there? That's right there. That's all it takes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, oh, I have to know, I have to know. Who's the boss? Yours truly. <laughs> Yours truly. She's deep. So you, <laughs> you own the grindstone yes, for life? Grindstone. And what was grindstone? It was in Philadelphia, 1404 North 52nd Street. Uh, originally, it was my father's first dental office when we returned to Philadelphia. So when he moved up the street, he sat empty for a while. I started with the S3P party, shout out to my old hip hop crew. We used to have dollar parties in there. And then when I got a little older, uh, a friend of mine took me to a Google club called Fox Valley. It's an iconic go-go club back in the day. I had to rent money in the front pocket. I had to play money in the back pocket. Or vice versa. Yeah, play money in the front pocket, rent money in the back pocket. Needless to say, all the money was gone. And I was like, this is a sweet hustle. And uh, my style gone, and the next thing I know, uh, we was building a uh, erotic, female erotic dance. Well, actually, it was going to be a male erotic dancing club at first. Really? Because I knew all the women. Okay. You know what I mean? I was popular guys, high school, whatever. And uh, the first night we opened, we were a, a male exotic dancing club. Uh, but the women were cheap, and the guys were, wanted to be me. So I flipped the script after the first night, and the rest is history. Wow. So, yeah. so. We're going to backtrack a little bit. Tell us a little background, a little more on I Feel I Leave. Well, at the time when I was 16, my first little taste of fame, I, I had a radio show and I had a television show. Mm -hmm. um, but being in that life kind of like tainted me, if you will, because I was the go-get-it guy. Anything that the stars needed, they came to the station, they would get it from anything from a drug pickup to prostitutes to, you know, a guy, whatever they needed, mm -hmm. they would send me to go get it. So they kind of like tainted me and, um, you know, the rest was history, you know, I opened up the club. I thought it would be great because all the stuff they was teaching me and having me do, mm -hmm. I thought it would be, you know, a great safe way right, like in the um, business. Transferable skills. From right, 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 right. But they firm upon because it was an erotic dance club. And when I do a thing, if, I got my, if I'm all in, I'm all in. Well, of course, it's an erotic dance club. They're going to have issues. I mean, sex sells, but of course, it's still taboo to a, to a point. Yeah, but... Yeah. But you got around that with grindstone. I mean, a lot of them came. Okay. You know what I'm saying? A lot of them came. Some of them had to keep it politically correct. But on, for the most part, most of them came through eventually anyway. Even my father. Oh. Mm. I did. <laughs> yeah. Now, the, chapter, the part of the passage that you happened to read out of the book was straight out of the first chapter, correct? Mm -hmm. So the book opens up with, I mean, a serious scene. You're talking about mm -hmm. the, the cops are coming in, they're raiding the club, they're looking for the boss, you have uh, strippers with pistols, they packing, they got money here, they're left and right. I mean, it doesn't sound like a strip club. It sounds like a whole lot more. It's hustling on the block. It's five dudes. Five, 52nd Street is synonymous for violence. It, 52nd mm -hmm. and Master was deemed back in, I think it was 2008, the most dangerous corner in America. Now that beat out Compton, Chicago, small stuff. I come from Sabine Streets. And when was Grindstone open? During that time frame? No, Grindstone was over in 1996. Okay, okay. 
But even during those days, uh, Black Junior Black Mafia, right. Spread Up the Street, uh, all, all, all that, all that kind of, let me tell you something. David Ruffin from The Temptation got this dope down a block from where I live that, that he owed me though. Oh, wow. 52nd Street is notorious for the, the roughest, toughest gangsters and the best dope. I'm just going to call it like I see it. The reason why I started the book like that, because I didn't, I wanted to hit the, hit the, hit the, hit the street runner. Mm -hmm. One. Number two is I wanted the reader to be like the cops, walking into the club for the first time, don't know about the life, right. and then eventually, as you read through the story, you pick up on every. You pick up on and you like and hate whoever you want to like, right? Right, because it's. I mean, going through the story, you have. You interweave a lot of the 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 what you've dealt with, a lot of your background and and history, with a lot of uh, the story of the the grindstone. It, it it sounds very fact based. True, oh. it, it doesn't sound embellished as much no. as I've read some other books wow. that are fact based. But it just seems that you have managed to really grasp what happened with these ladies. Right. I don't even want to call them strippers um, because you. Like because <laughs> you don't, you didn't look at them as strippers. You looked at them as family. Yeah, well, you know, you know, hustles, you know, mutual hustles. Mm -hmm. Trust me, when you run in a club, especially with the right dancer, you are definitely in competition with her. I want to sell these ten cases of Heineken in the back. You want to get everybody in the lap then. <laughs> the other person wants to sell all this dope out of the pocket. This guy want to do this. This guy, yeah, listen. We all in competition, we all hustling together, we all making money. And then when I took on one of my partners, Quentin, in the book, uh, and I changed everybody's name except mine. Okay. And one other person. And you're QDZ in the book. Uh, okay. Okay. But I changed everybody's name except for one, two people, me and Anwar. And why is that? Because he, he was doing some wild stuff to some kids, and I told her, I, I told her. Get that ass. And I got you. <laughs> she, yeah, you just starting I, stuff already. Right. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Woo! Read the book. I mean, the way the book reads, it reminds me, and I, I'm a movie person, I'm a movie person. Mm -hmm. So it reminds me of The Best Man when Tay Diz's character wrote his book. And it was so close to home mm -hmm. that it almost destroyed his close friendships to those around. It has for me. Okay. It really has for me. And I told them all, I said, look, I changed the name. They made me change the name. I said, cool. I changed the name. Um, another reason why, you know, those that got mad at me are still doing the same stuff to this day. And that's why they mad. They ain't mad at me. They mad because, you know, 20 years, you haven't leveled up. Those who leveled up, mm -hmm. love the book. Mm -hmm. Love the book. Hey, man, you caught it. You sorry. You wanna, if you remember in the 90s, Read that book, I'll take it. <laughs> now, before we continue, where can we get the grindstone for life? The unauthorized truth. Amazon. All day, a day. Amazon, or you can uh, reach out to Black Love Poetry Series and get autographed copies for 25 Amazon got that for nineteen ninety nine, I believe. Nice, nice. No, $17. And going through this book, I had a chance to get through a very good part, almost up to the very end, which I never give away the endings to the books that I read on the show. Because, you know, you got to give them a reason to want to dive into the book, get into it and find out what's going on. Right. But for me, reading the book, it was, it was kind of hard to read some of these ladies' stories because it really took them through twists, turns, emotions. I mean, when I was speaking with Cinnamon Brown earlier, and we were discussing her book, uh, Poetically Speaking, Truth, Love, Lies, and Disappointments. The three ladies in that book, um, one of them, Pauline, she just, she, it was like her truth. I mean, it really took her through real situations that, that you could relate to. That's what I'm getting at. It, 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 it was very relatable. And a lot of these ladies, even though they were strippers, it's still relatable. It still hit home. Yeah, I mean, you know. It's no different than a guy, a young guy, going out here to these corners and want to sell drugs. Right. You know what I'm saying? Or stick up kid. I, I knew bank robbers in that book. You know, QC is in that book. And he used to hide out 
when they was looking for his ass, as they killed the cat. Mm-hmm. He used to hide out in our club. You know what I'm saying? When they were investigating us about the bus stuff, they saw him, and that's, you know, mm-hmm. the rest is history. Turn their attention to him. Right, right. So it's like, I mean, and he was my first baller, by the way. Okay. He, you know, you know, different situations, it's how you build your clientele, and stars tell stars, money guys, hustlers tell hustlers. So job guys tell guys at the job, hey, yo, that's the spot. They got this, they got that. Right. And, and and I'm telling you, you go in there, man, I had the guys in derbies, suits, ties, uh, the ladies in right. 20s. Because it didn't read like a strip club or a stripper's club that I went right. to, it, it, that I would go to. It, would, it read more like a, a gentleman's club. Um, something where they could come and see the ladies, you know, right. strippers do their thing, but they right. still got that personal attention. Oh, yeah. Um, so it's them. So it wasn't just coming in and, you know, dropping the dollars. You actually got a little more than that. When you were there. Well, you had to drop the dollars. We didn't play no games. Mm. You know what I mean? Um, the security was was Brotherhood Security. They are iconic in Philadelphia mm-hmm. of locking down most of the clubs down there. And I had the privilege, God rest his soul, Big Wayne. Big Wayne was the head security for Guy and, and Blackstreet. Mm-hmm. And uh, 400 pounds, 6'6", six, six, box of judo. And he used just to hang out, play pity pet with my partner. <laughs> we didn't have to pay him to be there. You know what I mean? Because his queen, his fiance, committed suicide. So he couldn't sleep. So mm-hmm. he'd come to the club just to hang out. Wow. And all he did was play cards. He'd tip a little bit, but you know, he ain't never did nothing crazy. You know what I'm saying? And then, um, you know, but we got mad respect because they like, yo, they got Big Wayne in the house. Right. You know what I'm saying? And he, he's on our side. You know what I mean? So, and you've had a few names come through the club. It wasn't just for stripping. You've had a few people come through and use the club as a platform, a springboard. Yeah. Yeah. To, to further their careers. Yeah, it's a kind of that uh, Eve uh, was one of our, uh, mm-hmm. our dancers, and you could tell she wasn't really a dancer. Her heart was there. All she wanted it was to rock that mic. Mm-hmm. And um, we recently presented, uh, presented the book to her. We are the ones that welcomed Alan Iverson to Philadelphia. They had a big bash for him at uh, the First Union Center, what it was called, mm-hmm. and they had all this. You know, five lands in the plan, and they had this old nasty food. And he's he just like, I'm just a, you know, I'm from Virginia, and I don't want none of that. <laughs> so he came to our club, uh, 15 Lexuses, with his, then they had his signing bonus in his pocket. <laughs> Hello! <laughs> so we patted her down, and then my, my boy Storm, it's my dog for life. He gave me that wink, like, there's money in this building. But it came so early, we only had one dancer, so we got a funny story here. <laughs> you say that it reminds me of Players Club, yeah. when he hit the button and all the girls came running upstairs to get the green. Well, there was no girls there, it was just one girl. So she held it down, though. She held it down. Shouts out to Sash, you know. Now, I did, have a, I, I did notice one thing out of the book, Grindstone. Um, you know, it, it is a club. Strippers, money, drugs coming through. Uh, you know, they come in, they come out. But the difference that I found is with your relationships with many other females, it, it wasn't a quote-unquote pimp relationship. No. It was more so a family. My mama was there. She was in the kitchen. So mama ain't going to This is me. It's my mother. Family effort, a concerted family my effort. Mother, my mother, she, she, first of all, she didn't allow me to call them bees. Okay. Uh, anything derogatory. That's why I came up with the ladies of the night, and she was just like right there. And she was everybody's mom. Okay. So, you know what I mean? They would run up to the bar, ask all kind of questions and stuff like that. So, everybody was just family, you know what I mean? And then my girl at the time, which is my uh, ex-wife, she was the bartender. So, you know, she made it very difficult <laughs> for me at the food. The other guys, the staff, they had the ball. Me? Not so much. And I'm asking that because you were telling me now you have 18 godchildren. Yeah. And this is from the ladies of the night. This is how much family yeah, became. Yeah, most of them. Most of them. 
Yeah, I believe so. Because like I said, we, we have a groundstone for life reunion. And we, you know, everybody bring the kids and, uh, and and stuff like that. So we watch them grow. And, and I don't know, people just keep giving me their kids. Like, yo, you dead, dad. <laughs> Do y'all realize I got five <laughs> biologicals myself? I said this. Uh, it's a lot of y'all. And I've been a 22. But uh, this is what I'll do for y'all. If I see you messing up out there in the street, mm -hmm. I'll let your ass know. That's about all I can like do for you. Mm -hmm. But yeah, take her, take you in, take her out. Now, what was the motivation for writing the book? I mean, it's one thing for it to be a tell all, it happened, but why write about it? Back in 2013, I suffered a stroke. And um, that's all I had left was my memory. When I was the man on the strip, and I just, I, said, I told my people, I said, they're like, you want anything in the house? I said, bring me my laptop. I got something to put down. You know, I always thought of it. Uh, our story would be a great movie, mm -hmm. and uh, that's all I had left. You know, uh, the wife at the time, she was on some other stuff, and uh, put me in the poorhouse. So when I got out of the hospital, I actually was homeless. I was living in my dental lab. Couldn't make teeth anymore, and that's all I had was that book, and I ate off that book ever since. Anywhere I go, I've sold that book on yachts at fifty dollars a pop. I've been to Seattle and back with that book, mm -hmm. just that a bag of books and some clothes, like on some straight up hobo shit. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I've recently right. going back to the dead on the kids love that. If they weren't feeling the starving artist, <laughs> like, like most yes. they like yeah. that. Daddy, where you going back? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm back, baby. So, so that means you're back in the dental office. So you had a dental practice. Yes. Okay. In Philadelphia, uh, actually Chester. Uh, we're right, uh, right by the Commodore Barry Bridge, uh, 2418 West 2nd Street. What's the name of the business? Tri-State Dental. Okay. Saving lives one smile at a time. Nice. I love that slogan. Yeah. I do, I do. Yeah. And it, it, it just, for that, for you to be from here to go to your dental practice, let me ask. What? Are you still QD today? <laughs> Does he still creep around, lurk around, anywhere? Yeah, if you get mad. <laughs> I'm just saying, he get mad. Yeah, he, he'll, he'll pop out. I'm 12 people. Who do you want to speak to? Uh, that's how that go. That seems to be a common thing amongst writers is, is they take on that facet of different characters, different people. Are you hearing these characters speak to you and, and, and you hear their stories? Well, they real people. I know these people. You know what I'm saying? I know these people. From the killers to the dancers to the drug dealers, everybody. I know that these are real people. I just changed the name. Now, as far as me, that was me 20 years. You know what I'm saying? Right. When I had, when my daughter started getting bigger, and they used to come, because I was living at the club at one time before I got up on the house, right? Mm -hmm. I was actually living at the club, and my daughters used to come over to visit, and, and my, uh, my third to the oldest jumped on that damn stage and started touring around the club. She's mm -hmm. an erotic dancer to this day. So, mm -hmm. I mean, hey. I hear know. father say my only job is to keep my daughter off that pole. Yeah, and, 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 mm -hmm. and when I start seeing them like, like, ugh, all right, that's what made me get out of the game. Okay. That's what made me get out, because my daughter start getting bigger and they start hearing things. Right. And you always get the bridge right. I don't care if you're the dancer, the club owner, the bartender. People always want to embellish. What we do, but actually, man, them sisters are some hard working athletes. Let me tell you how hard it is to dance non stop from midnight to sometimes eight in the morning, mm -hmm. sweating through the outfits. Mm -hmm. Gotta stay smelling good, stay upbeat, take the disrespect, mm -hmm. keep these thirsty ass men in line, and still make another break. Right. Oh my 
goodness. Well, Mr. Ali, I appreciate you so much for coming through and discussing your book, The Unauthorized Truth, The Grindstone for Life. Again, you can find this book on Amazon.com. It is available. You can contact him through Black Love Poetry Series Network uh, online at Facebook to get an autographed copy just like I have. I really, really, I love the smell of a, of a physical book. I do, I do. I, I really appreciate it. I do. But thank you so much for coming through. Thanks for having me. Hope you come back again because you do have another book out. So, uh, yeah, we got to discuss that. Memoirs of a Deep Town Yes. Amen. Well, thank you again, sir. I so thank appreciate you. the love. Thank you.